Hi, everyone. I am Connie Ryan, and I'm the Executive Director of Interfaith Alliance of Iowa, and this is What's Happening. It is our weekly forum where we talk with an expert on a particular subject, and we've had really great conversations this summer on a, a variety of subjects. If you are watching on Facebook, it's also on YouTube, but if you're watching on Facebook, you can put comments and ask questions in the comment section, and hopefully we will have time to get the, to those, but I'm really glad that you have joined us for what's happening. And I am really glad to have Dr. Jennifer Harvey, and um, she is a professor at Drake University, professor of religion, and a good friend, and I am grateful for your time and for you, uh, for you joining us. Welcome, Thank Jennifer. Thanks, Connie. I'm so glad to be here for this conversation. Good to see you. Uh, well, it's great to see you as well. And um, so we're going to talk about critical race theory, which is all in the news all over the place. And, and we're going to talk about what it is and what it is not. And um, so it's this phrase that has been tossed around. I, I think people like just say it in their sleep, right? Like it's just <laughs> It is just everywhere. Um, and so I just want to start off and kind of give us a baseline, right? I, I just want to talk about where did critical race theory originate, kind of who was involved in that, when did that happen, and where is it used, I'll use this term legitimately, mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of the actual critical race theory. So I'll just let you kind of take a hold of that. You bet. So critical race theory is actually a body of academic work that developed in legal studies. So it's really a kind of graduate level legal studies kinds of kind of theory. Um, it originated in the 1970s and the 1980s. Um, folks like Kimberly Crenshaw, um, who also sort of developed the notion of intersectionality. She is one of the founders, developers of this theory around race and in investigating race critically in the law. Derek Bell, who is no longer with us, is one of the early, he wrote an amazing book called Faces from the Bottom of the Well that was one of the first books in critical race theory, again, decades old. Ian Haney Lopez, a bunch of other scholars, Richard Delgado, who basically wrote, about, began to develop a theory in, of, around the law that essentially said, race is a phenomena in US American life and it affects the law. And we need to think about that critically when we're thinking about the function of the law in US American society. That's kind of its base sort of fundamental argument. Thank you. And, and so I want people to kind of keep that in mind as we continue this conversation. Um, again, I'll tell folks that if you have questions or comments, put them in the chat. Um, in the comment section, and um, hopefully we'll have time to get to those. So that is where it originated. That's where critical race theory originated and kind of some of the founders and, and the undergirdings of that. What is critical race theory not? Critical race theory is not um, any invocation of the word race or any claim about race in history or um, even saying something like, oh, in our current um, economic uh, structures, white people have historically had more access um, to acquiring um, high quality education or housing loans. That's not critical race theory. It's not one of the ways I'm hearing critical race theory talked about in the public right now is that anytime someone mentions the word race or says anything that implies race is a real phenomena in US life is, is being called critical race theory. And um, that has its own sort of, uh, there's reasons that's going on that we should also talk about, but just at baseline to separate out like that anytime we say, anytime we say race exists, that in and of itself is not the use of critical race theory. And so the reason that's really important is because right now we're seeing this kind of hysterical, um, oh my goodness, critical race theory is being taught in K through 12 education. Frankly, um, that's frankly an absurd claim. No 10th grader studies legal theory that I know of in the United States of America, in the state of Iowa. And so when something like that's going on, you start to go, huh, there's kind of, a, there's some kind of hysteric agenda here that we need to be critically thinking about. So 
just because someone says race is real doesn't mean they are an advocate of critical race theory. Chances, I mean, very few of us even know what critical race theory is. So we just need to separate those out. So it's not um, curriculum at the K-12. You're Never. one of our, our kindergartners, um, the legal um, theory. And it, it's not indoctrination because we talk about race or racism at any level. It's not um, critical race theory is not about indoctrination of our children. It, it does talk about critical race theory does talk about race as a construct. Yes. And that's one of the tenets of um, the points of critical race theory. So before we talk about crit critical race theory or talk about racism, I guess, as a construct, what is a construct in, in social sciences? Sure. So let me back up just one second. So you said something really important. I want all of our listeners to hear, however they might be thinking about or experiencing this public discussion. Anytime you use the word theory, <laughs> you should already know indoctrination is not what is happening. Because a theory, even before we get to the construct piece, a theory is basically saying we need to sort of design a way to ask and think and question this thing that's going on. Take race out of it. Um, evolution is a theory. Creationism is a theory. Theory is one of the ways we test how um, interpretations of reality. So anytime we're proposing a theory, we're never indoctrinated anyone because theories by design can be revised and changed and made better in terms of interpreting what's going on. So the theory part is really important. I'm glad they haven't dropped the theory word because right there, we know we're not indoctrinated anyone. If we're talking about critical race theory, theory is basically a question. Should we think about this this way? Okay, so critical race theory, one of its tenets is that um, race is a social construct. This is actually a pretty simple and really important thing. Anything that is a construct in our world as humans is something that we basically have built out of culture, out of our human relations, out of our decision making, out of the ways we decide to set up a political system. The US government is a construct. Um, how we talk about something like, um, what it means to be a woman or what it means to be a man. It's a construct, right? It might be, you know, bad or good or both or true or false or both, but it's a construct. It's something that we built. And that's human life is full of constructs. Um, it's kind of how we function as human beings. Critical race theory, one of a few of its basic principles, um, that I think are actually interesting and important to talk about, but we'll just talk about this one for now, is that race is a construct. What this means is not that race isn't real, but what it does mean is that race isn't in our DNA. There's nothing inside Jen Harvey as a white US American that could be coded in my genetics as white. Race is something that a society says, oh, in the US, Look at that person's skin tone. Look at that person's hair texture. Listen to that person's accent. Notice that person's name. Social phenomena, right? That then get attached to laws, economic policies, um, experiences in school systems. So I'll give you a very specific example. In the 1600s, um, Nobody was sure in the 1600s on this land base yet what one's physical attributes, what one looked like physically or who they descended from, what that meant in terms of whether they were considered legally enslavable or not legally enslavable, right? There were, there were people from Europe who were indentured servants. There were people from Europe that, and, and so all these questions, right? The law started to say in the 1600s, hey, if you have this, these phenotypes, if you have dark skin, the word that was used was the Spanish word for black, it's Negro in the 1640s. If you have these phenotypes, if you descend from this person, this line, we are gonna say the law says it's, it, the law says it's legitimate to enslave you. And out of that interaction between the law, people's bodies, and then how people treated the law and people's bodies, race came to be, that's it. It got built, just like we can build a house 
the house is real, but it's built because we designed it. We could also change it later. And it does change over time. That's that's sort of the base, what it means to say race is a social construct. construct. It's real, it exists, but it's been built between the interaction of people's bodies, what the law says about people's bodies and how we all treat those things. And suddenly we have race. And sometimes I would say even um, perceptions also in all of that. And because we know that there's a, a spectrum of um, skin tones. We know that there are different um, inflections with with speech and with with voice, and so also it's it's the perceptions that we that we hear and see within our own lives that that kind of inform all of all of that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I and I love that because when we start to talk about perceptions, it becomes very quickly clear how movable and changeable this all is. And this actually also brings us back to a, a fantastic thing that critical race theory, the actual body of work offers us if we're interested, which is this, and lots of Americans don't know this. In the 1900s, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, you were not allowed to, to naturalize as a citizen to the United States of America unless you were white, quote unquote white, right? This was the law. Um, but we nobody knew what it even meant to be white. So in that construct, were Mexicans immigrating to the United States white? Were people immigrating from, from South Asia, from India, were they white? We had all of these cases that went through the courts where the law literally said, well, how do you decide who's white or who's not white? We knew that black people were not white and we knew that native people were not white. We, the, we had, as a nation, socially constructed that clarity, right? Um, I'm not defending that clearly, but that's what we yeah. had decided. But then it was like, but then what are the gradations of white? Literally the law got involved, the Supreme Court saying, well, if you have these phenotypes, you are white. And if you don't, then you don't. And some of it, when you read it also today, we'd be like, well, South Asian people aren't white, but some of those cases said that they were, right? And this is precisely the kind of thing critical race theory says. It's like, look at this. The law has helped construct all of this stuff. It's important we learn to talk about it. So perception, like when I perceive that person, is that per race is really blurry, dynamic and movable. It's very real, but it's not, it just doesn't come to be on its own. We're sort of making these decisions all the time individually, but also collectively and through the law, which is what CRT helps us talk about in more effective ways once we're in like college, right? <laughs> <laughs> which we have some amount of understanding and right ability to, to think um, constructively and critically and yeah not in kindergarten right exactly um, so you mentioned earlier that there were some other some basic pieces of critical race theory beyond race being a construct so you want to outline um, a, a few of those sure one of them is simply that rate what race critical race theorists say call racism is ordinary which is not to say racism is acceptable, but that racism is ordinary, it's everywhere. And so because of that, if we say racism is ordinary, it means we should stop being surprised when we see it and it, that it's embedded in the law too. That there's, very, there's no kind of neutral law that doesn't somehow impact whether or not we end up with racism or not. And so racism is, is ordinary and it's ended up tangled up in the law. Um, that's it. A second is what we just discussed at length. Race is a social construct. The amazing gift of being able to theorize that race is a construct. What I like to tell my students is if something's a construct, it's real. I built my house, my house has been constructed, but it's real. But if it's not designed in a way that's good for my neighborhood, we could rebuild it. We could build it differently. So that's what the second tenant, race is a construct. Um, it also, this is really important, talks about, Derek Bell was famous for this, interest convergence, which means that, so take Brown versus Board of Education, the very famous case of desegregating schools, which we know schools weren't really desegregated officially then until like the 70s, and we know we're fighting that fight still. Board, Brown versus Board of Education, desegregating schools did not just happen because of the goodwill of people's hearts. Brown versus Board of Education, there's lots of evidence that part of the reason we finally formally said we're going to desegregate schools is because it was becoming really bad for the United States to be critiquing 
communism in the USSR <laughs> and saying, we believe in rights here, but we had segregated schools. Derek Bell argued that Brown versus Board of Education finally could hit a tipping point because the United States own interest in being able to have a good reputation when it came to equality meant we had to desegregate our schools or our arguments against atheist communist USSR didn't really hold water. So, so interest convergence. Well, and, and self-interest maybe. Also. Yes, yes. <laughs> like when it's good for an institution right. to make a change towards more inclusion, it's more likely to do it. That's it. And that's actually not a strange theory. Like all kinds of Christian theorists, Reinhold Niebuhr said, institutions don't on their own do good. Institutions are real, like they're real. They're, they're about power, right? So that's critical race theory helps us talk about that. The last one I'll mention is that critical race theory also says, and we have all kinds of data that this is really a very good theory and a good way to investigate things, is that civil rights legislation, when we have passed it, has almost always also benefited non-Black and brown people. White people have often benefited from civil rights le legislation. Just like white women benefited from the tiny bit of affirmative action we did do for a little bit in the country. It hasn't been much, but white women benefited from it mightily. And so the argument is that civil rights legislation has been good for everybody, never just for the group that has most done the work to advocate for it, right? And so um, that's one of the things critical race theory also wants to talk about is that when you do well by those who are most marginalized, everybody does better. Kind of the lifting of all boats. Um, yes. Mentality theory. Yeah. It is. yeah, by centering the folks that are, whose experience has been most sunk low by the social and economic structures yeah. and legal structures. So um, so th thank you for kind of outlining that for us and giving us a little bit more information and, and base of what what it is and, and the tenets of, of the theory. Um, those are all the positive pieces of it. Are there legitimate concerns about critical race theory that we need to think about coming from an academic perspective, from a theorist perspective, from educators, social scientists? Are there legitimate concerns with it? Um, you know, in some ways I would say no, to the extent that, I, I mean, I have never read a critical race theorist essay or book and that has ever tried to presume or present the theory being articulated as somehow um, closed, not up for discussion and debate, not open to being improved or not being revisable if the claims being hypothesized prove to not be true. Um, you know, I think some folks might say, I don't happen to disagree, I don't happen to agree with this, but I do think there's a pretty pessimistic feeling in critical race theory itself um, because of the way that taking race seriously in the United States really does lead to some pretty difficult conclusions about like hopefulness. <laughs> so I've sometimes heard the critique of critical race theory that it's like, it doesn't generate enough hope. Um, and on the one hand, I think that's important to sort of acknowledge because I do think as an activist and advocate and educator myself, we always have to have, I like to say, to sort of think about how do we keep people moving and believing that change is possible. And sometimes if you really steep yourself in critical race theory, you're like, wow, this stuff is, will we ever really get somewhere? But what I would say about that is I don't think that's a flaw or an illegitimacy in the, the illegitimacy illegitimacy in the work itself, I think it's actually a pretty frank read of 400 plus years of US American history. So I find it difficult emotionally sometimes, but that to me in and of itself is not an, an illegitimacy in the work. Um, I also believe that some of like Kimberly Crenshaw in particular, she her writing, she's trying to help us think about how could we build a democracy that really worked for more folks, right? What could voting look like if we had different ways of thinking about voting? And so um, I think uh, I think for the most part, there's, you know, I don't have a, at this point, a, a concern about legitimacy because no theorist is claiming it's not open to revision. And that would be when I would get nervous if that started to happen. I've never seen that. Well, and really uh, to your point about hope or not hope, naming, 
what our society currently is and has been, you know, for 400 years and the, the, the changes that have happened and, and putting a, putting a structure around that, I actually think gives us hope because it's, it's naming it out loud and, and, um, and, and the points that, that you have made, but that allows us the ability to make changes in a, in a structured way, in a, um, plan for strategic way if you're yeah. looking at all of those pieces. So to me, that actually brings hope. Yeah. Um, but I also kind of live up in my head sometimes too. <laughs> <laughs> Take that all with a grain of salt. Yeah. <laughs> um, are there, can you take critical race theory and um, is there a way to put it into practical applications? And, and I don't mean, you know, teaching it to kindergartens. That's not, not, not what I mean. But we take theories um, those social constructs and, and all of that. And we often put, often put it into practical applications. Is there a way to do that or a way that you've seen critical race theory doing that, that is, um, that is helpful? Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that I have found most helpful about it in my own life and my own journey is the way that, um, critical race theory, and I'm thinking again, mostly of Kimberly Crenshaw's work, which is just fantastic. Um, because critical race theory kind of peels back um, perceptions and sort of stuff that we learn as common sense, but that actually got built, I have found that it has enabled me as a white US American person um, to have much, some very concrete um, inroads to understanding something like, um, I, I, I hate almost using this phrase anymore because people use it so broadly and all the time now, but like white privilege, right? That I can really through critical race theories, when I started to be able to go, oh, here's the pathways, the legal pathways, the economic pathways through which my own white racial identity, which should be neutral because it's not like, it's not a real, it's not a thing, right? I was just born this way, whatever. But here's the real ways, the concrete paths through which my racial identity kind of got complic made complicit in this structure made it made my own white racial identity have kind of a material content to it that as someone who is deeply committed to equity and fairness and justice, I want to actually learn how to reject and undo and critical race theory by making really concrete those access points has given me some pathways to think about, okay, so if my whiteness, my journey means X relative to access to higher education, for example, how might I as an educator use that analysis to think about designing an educational program, say at Drake University or somewhere else, that undid some of that and created greater access for all uh, young people in the United States, especially and including African-American and Latinx young people, right? Um, it, for me, it becomes a really helpful tool for going, okay, if this is how this stuff has been put together, then to create real justice and fairness, here's some possibilities for what we could design instead. Um, that to me has been the most helpful is just the kind of critical framework it makes visible that then helps us design something different and new. We don't have to live with this stuff. We could choose to build a different system. And what you said about it's hopeful to really understand what has been Critical race theory certainly provides that in a way that helps us think about, okay, yes, yeah, some fundamental redesigns are necessary that take seriously the experience of oppression. And by doing that would ultimately make our systems more equitable for everybody. But by starting with bait, taking seriously that race has been and continues to be a serious phenomena relative to subjugation and oppression in our systems in the United States. So I'm gonna shift us a little bit and talk about kind of the other side of the conversation on critical race theory and those who I would say are using it for political gain. Um, and we've heard some people even, politicians primarily, even say that um, race racism is not a thing anymore, that, that we've, you know, if we had racism in our country, we've solved that problem. Um, and so we've seen particularly in Iowa, because that's, you know, where we live and, and eat and breathe politics here. Um, it's critical race theory has been used or maybe misused 
um, as um, uh, for political gain for um, for moving particular issues forward. Um, so let's talk a little bit about critical race theory and kind of this um, narrative that we're seeing and what um, political, social, religious conservatives are saying about critical race theory that is and isn't correct. And this is kind of going back full circle to the, the beginning of our conversation. What are you um, seeing and hearing that um, that they are saying that is not correct, and maybe if they are saying anything that is correct. So what I am seeing right now is that um, any project, and I'm thinking specifically, of course, Nicole Hannah-Jones 1619 project has been um, sort of swept up in this, um, because it takes seriously the history of race and racism in the United States. Um, I've heard people talking about um, it, workshops where folks talk about white privilege or anti-racism, that essentially what I am hearing is any space in education or otherwise um, where race is taken seriously and the United States' history of race including how the history of race and racism continues to affect us today. Any place that that's happening is in and of itself critical race theory. And I think what I'm seeing, and that's just, as we've discussed, that's just factually incorrect. Most people have never actually read a critical race theorist in their lives because it's a very academic discipline. But the larger point still is important because what we are seeing, Connie, is a, a, a kind of intentional use, because CRT, look how fast that rolls off the tongue. We all know what it is now. I was just talking to someone uh, in the last couple of days who was very distressed by this. And I thought, and I asked them, I said, they said, oh, this is now coming into colleges. I was like, this has been taught in colleges since the eighties. This is not, this is not new. You just now are like being given an acronym, but what this person described was just this other stuff that we're talking about race at all, right? Um, and so what we are seeing, what I am seeing is that just this broad use of a term that because nobody really knows what it is, including the folks using it for the most part, is being used as a scare tactic to kind of bludgeon any of us or any of the places where we would dare say that racism still exists and that we all have a role in creating equity and justice. It's just becoming this like bludgeoning tool to shut down actually very evidence-based conversations and public learning about our act the actual state of things in our nation. Um, it's dangerous. It's really dangerous the way that's going on because it's almost like it's whipping up the sort of fear primitive part of our brains, right? And that's not me being negative. Like that's just, we have that as humans, we have our fight, flight and fright, flight or fight <laughs> brain, right? right? And race, nativism, uh, disparaging of groups of people who are not us, that is often, that's a historical tactic that gets used in lots of nations, not just our own. When that gets whipped up, um, we end up in, in some pretty dangerous places in terms of our civic body and the politics that we are all, are all living in. And CRT is literally being used to do that. And part of the way we know that is the way folks are using it isn't accurate to what it even is. But we know that many times we've got so many um, tensions and fault lines and fears around how we talk about race in the United States that politically folks just start going, oh yeah, these race, this race stuff, it's a, it's a kind of race baiting that's just literally shutting down our ability to have good civic dialogue, critically think together and say, actually, we're all invested, you know, we all at least say we're invested in democracy, what would that actually look like? So this is a pretty dangerous moment. Um, and I think unpacking what it actually is so that we can say, we need to all calm down and we need to not take the bait. We need to not give this oxygen. We need to shut it down because it's being used for a kind of fight or flight collective phenomena that is very dangerous. I would add to that, that I think that part of it is um, in the post George Floyd murder world that we live in now, um, and that a lot of the Black Lives movement um, is being driven by young people that the intersectionality of young people and public education, that some people believe that they have been taught this critical race theory, whatever that is, which has 
um, allowed them to to um, be protesters and, and create this this chaos in our, our society. And I think that we're seeing on the legal side of it and at the legislature, certainly at the Iowa legislature, where um, many of us spend too much time, um, it, it is a reaction to the protests and that public schools are therefore responsible for this because they um, gave them the tools in order to protest over here. Um, and it, so I, th I think that's some of the pushback on yeah. public schools and, and um, misplacing in public schools, um, including higher ed, um, all of this confluence of, of these different pieces in the last year. I don't know. What do you think about that? I think that's brilliant and really important. I'm glad you brought it up for a couple of reasons. One, to me, it's so ironic that anybody concerned about the mobilizations that have happened in the last year, I mean, in a, in a, in a, in a really massive way, they were going on since Trayvon Martin was murdered. But, yes. you know, last year was certainly a kind of watershed in terms of size. Anyone who thinks that Black youth got that kind of prowess and clarity from the public school system, I mean, that, I mean, it's, it's sad, but like, because public school education, I say this with all love for teachers, it's not, it's about what we allow curricular wise, like that, that's not where most young people learn to be organizers for justice. Most young people learn that from their families, from their communities, from needing to, to sort of mobilize, to have their lives valued in the social spaces they live in. So I, so that's just sort of like, when I hear you talk about that, I'm like, oh my gosh, like black communities, Going back to the civil rights movement, the civil rights movement was a church led, black church folks led that movement, and not because black youth led how to learned how to do that in school, right? right. So, um, so anyway, I just sort of needed to put that out there. But wouldn't it be awesome if we could have yes. one hundred and one right. and <laughs> right, right, like that? I mean, like it's like yeah, maybe, um, <laughs> but but um, this piece around the back, around backlash is really important because I, and it's so good. You're context, you just contextualize that for us in 20, about 2020, because one of the things we did see and this, and, and, and I think critical race theorists, I think of someone like Derek Bell, who again is no longer alive, but would have totally noted this, right. Um, in the summer of 2020, I mean, black young, young, black youth, young people have been leaning for years on racial justice, right? One of the things that happened in 2020 is that Black Lives Matter has been laying networks of mobilization down so persistently in day-to-day -day ways since, you know, 2011, 2010, 20, I'm going to have my years off, but 2010-ish, 11-ish, that the horror of George Floyd's murder combined with how much groundwork Black Lives Matter and others had done for years now, without many of us even having it on our radar, kind of enabled not just Black youth to rise up and lead in the summer of 2020 and beyond, but actually powerful Black leadership to which more white people responded than has happened in decades. That's what scared the heck out of those who are opposed to a racial justice agenda. And that phenomena is also one that has recurred repeatedly in our history. So folks like Michelle Alexander and William Barber of the Moral, uh, Moral Majority talk about this all the time. After the civil, right, civil War, we had a moment where we thought about, and some white people thought too, maybe we should create a just society. And some powerful figures who did not want that said, oh, let's find some ways to like wedge, put a wedge between white working class people and black working class people, newly um, newly freed and enslaved, formerly enslaved people so that they can't ally together and actually create equity. This is a moment like that. And so backlash is always to be expected when we start making real significant movement on the racial justice front, which we had seen white folks in the streets last summer, again, not leading, they were, res we, they, we were responding to black leadership, right? That wasn't, so I'm not saying that's a feather in our cap. We were responding, but responding more powerfully than we've seen in 20 years. And I think that that's part of like backlash always comes after the possibility of some movement. And that's what this is. And so knowing that is, again, why I want to say to all of us, wherever we might land in our understanding is like we need to not take the bait. We need to not let it shut us down from showing up in support of black leadership. We need to not give it more oxygen. We need to educate and calm down and say, 
we're not we're keeping our eye on the prize to borrow a phrase from the civil rights we're keeping our eyes on the prize because we saw last summer what we need to do and we need to keep doing it even if people are trying to sort of throw grenades to kind of blow up the coalitions that 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 are really yearning and working to to get stronger and stronger and that we desperate we need multiracial coalition to win um, and I think more of us do want justice and equity than don't. And so this is like a move of desperation to like throw these acronyms out that scare people when they're not even real because we have a moral majority, we do. Yeah. And I, I think it's important to remind folks that as you said, every every movement, you look at the LGBTQ com community and the, the movement that, that has happened over the last um, couple of decades for, for sure, um, and the pushback by the religious right on that. And, and um, so we're just seeing some of the, as you said, with the civil rights movement, every time we see that, that pushback and misinformation and scare tactics and, and um, keeping focused is, is um, really important. I want to correct one thing that you said. Thank you. William Barber is not part of the moral majority. Um, <laughs> no, that's the wrong moral. <laughs> Poor People's Campaign, campaign. <laughs> started as more. It started as Moral Mondays. Yes. Poor People's Campaign. Thank you. That's a very different right. body. <laughs> Sorry, I, Reverend I, Barber. I bet you I just went. Wait a second. Thank you, Connie. <laughs> I knew you would um, want to take a moment to put him in the Thank right you. place. So Thank yeah. You. Thank you. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about um, the average person watching. Um, and they're doing their their daily thing or whatever, and their friend or their neighbor or a family member starts talking about critical race theory in the incorrect way and the the kind of harmful way. Um, what would you say? Um, give folks some shorthand of how they can respond to that um, with you know kindness, whatever. You don't have to yell at people, whatever. Um, but some shorthand notes of what talking to their friend about what critical race theory is and debunking what it is not. Yeah. So one strategy I find really, really helpful is to start by asking some questions. Um, if I have a friend or a colleague or someone I know starts making claims that feel like they're kind of amplified and I'm just sort of slow things down and say, can you tell me what, can you tell, okay, I hear you're saying CRT. Can you tell me what you think that is? Um, cause I'm, and, and also I'm saying, cause I'm not even sure. <laughs> like, or can you tell me what the thing is? Can you give me an example of how you think this is affecting your life in which, and then sometimes the response will give you what you need to say, oh, actually, I don't think that's happening. Any where is that happening? Or, oh, you don't think we should talk about enslavement in schools? Like, I actually do believe I want my children to learn about the history of enslavement so we can create a better democracy, right? So I really try and um, avoid when I can kind of saying, oh, well, you're wrong, or this isn't what it is, starting with, and not just with CRT, any race laden claim, which this is not new, right? right? I really try and start with questions to see if I can ask enough questions that we can find some point of common agreement about what we're even talking about. And then my next move will often be um, not necessarily even telling someone they're incorrect, but saying, you know, my experience is really different than that. I, as a white American, really want um, my neighbors to feel safe if we, you know, need X, Y, or Z in terms of policing. I really want my, you know, and, and sort of sh give my own sort of value um, not polemic, like you're wrong and you're not smarter, you know, whatever. I know more than you, nothing, not my values are these because I believe in, in all of us. And so I think we actually have to talk about the things in the room. So for example, I was in a conversation recently where someone was using CRT to talk about why they didn't want a young person to learn X, Y, or Z. It also became clear to me, this person has, um, an interest in becoming a, being involved in the medical field. So I said, you know, so I asked a question, some questions about what they thought CRT was and then said, you know, if we know that um, black women die more often in childbirth than white women, I, I would presume a doctor, someone going in the medical field 
would need and want to care about that and be curious about that. And we can't ask about that, let alone fix it if we can't use the word race. And so that's for a really concrete example, who is gonna disagree that white women and black women should have, like, shouldn't have equal life outcomes from birth? Even someone who might have a different reason for why it's going on is, is not gonna say, well, I don't think that matters. Anyone, like that's a shared value. Many people, we might mean a lot of different things when we meet there, but that's really concrete. It's really clear. And then we can go from there to say, well, then how are we going to address that if we can't talk about race, right? So lots of questions, not getting into sort of, you know, parsing out the details fights, but more like, well, here's what, here's, I'm going to bear witness to my journey and my, with the things I care about relative to the question of race. And I want to try and find a way to even be on the same page about what we're even talking about, even if we ultimately disagree. But then I can say, you know, I really, really disagree with you. But I also hear you that you're scared right now. Like, and there is a lot of uncertainty. That is true. And I want equity for everyone. And I don't know how we get there without talking about race. And so I'm going to keep doing that. But I want to keep hearing what it is for you that's so scary about that. I think that's a, a fabulous approach to it and, and really kind of disarming of the the tension when when we bring up race or when it just brings itself up because <laughs> that happens too um, being able to just have a conversation and and to do it um, where where you've disarmed that, that tension in the room so to speak I think is quite helpful um, any other tips that you can that you can um, suggest to folks? Um, yeah, I would, one, I would just acknowledge too, in that conversation, it's really important for me just to name that that's a strategy that works and is important for me because I'm white. Um, I think people of color need, need, you know, have really different needs around cross racial engagement for sure. And I, you know, and, and so I'm really talking about those of us who are white and so who have access to conversations where sometimes racism is, is made more explicit because fo white folks will often say things to other white people that they won't publicly say around public people of color. So um, I just want to acknowledge that. And I think the other thing I would say, especially for those of us thinking about family journeys, I think bearing witness to your values and being um, clear about it, having um, engaged, calm as you can conversations over the long haul is one of the strategies we need in our extended white families, because I know personally, and I know I've heard other folks talk about this, that especially since 2016, white families, extended families have become hotbeds of pain and silence or arguments. And I think we need to, if we are gonna stay engaged in those spaces as white US Americans and our extended families, seeing it as long haul work, but not confusing long haul work with not always speaking up when something racist is going on in a family gathering. Now there's diverse strategies like kindness and saying, hey, but silence is not the strategy, but the strategy might be long haul. You're not gonna, it's not gonna be about you win an argument and then everyone in your family goes, aha. It's like <laughs> long-term bearing witness by walking your journey faithfully is what I think we are called to do. Um, and sometimes that will yield surprising fruits and other times it won't. But um, but it's it, this is a long haul long haul journey for for white U.S. Americans in particular. We have to be at it every day, and with public um, clarity. But it's in our relationships, and we have to if we're in those relationships, we have to stay in them and keep talking about it in those relationships. Yeah, yeah we all wish that we could. Um, put our aha moments onto somebody else and that they happen immediately. But um, we know that that's just not human nature. And yeah, but I think that the only way that we make progress in all of this is um, by continuing those, those conversations and doing that in relationship. And yes, also the protests and also those, those big taking advantage of those big moments um, to con continue the movement that is happening. We can't let that go. Mm -mm. Um, but also you change hearts and minds by by that that individual mm -hmm. personal interaction and relationship, yeah. especially with people that you already have yes. a relationship with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's different. I want to be clear the work you all are doing and at the political level is yeah. a really different strategy. Like yeah. we're not gonna we don't spend a ton like it's not about changing hearts and minds of the legislators who yeah. are literally enacting, but well, like we also oh have to organize politically, right? <laughs> right, that would be so, but 
that's a different kind of speaking truth yeah. to power and political organizing. So I'm not, so I definitely want to be clear. I'm not saying yeah. we need different strategies in different spaces. At the legislative session level, we got to just figure out, and I know you all are helping try to lead this and do this, how we win. Yeah. Because so because we're then changing hearts and minds under conditions that are more and less hostile and violent towards particular right. groups of people. Yeah, it is. It is all of that. I you know people say, is it this thing or is it this? Uh, yes, yes, and mm -hmm. it's all of those. Oh, yes, it's, it's protests. It's um, individual conversation. It is certainly working hard to change public policy. Yes. It, um, all, all are important pieces um, to any, in any social movement, um, social justice movement. So, yeah. Um, Jennifer Harvey, thank you so much for spending this time with me and for all of your work. And folks, if you don't know Reverend Dr. Jennifer Harvey, you should. And she has a couple of books out. And um, can you name those four folks if they want to sure. Google that? Yeah. Um, the most recent is Raising White Kids, Bringing Up Children in a Racially Unjust Society, which um, is accessible, story-based, lots about my own family and my own journey. And the other book is called Dear White Christians, for those still longing for racial reconciliation. And you can get either of those books at a get a, at an independent bookstore or at Amazon. Awesome. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Connie. I appreciate it. Shameless plug, you can also hear Dr. Jennifer Harvey at our annual award dinner slash 25th anniversary on August 30th. She and some other um, friends who I see both of the other two are actually on here, Bridget Stevens and Rob Johnson. So we're having a, a three-part kind of keynote kind of thing um, with some of our, our favorite uh, rock stars. Um, and and um, Jen is certainly one of those. And um, so you can find more information about that event on our website. If you um, don't know Interfaith Alliance, if you're coming to us just through this, you can learn more at our website at interfaithalliance.iowa.org. We are obviously on Facebook and YouTube, but also on Instagram and Twitter. And um, Jen Harvey, thank you so much for the conversation. I really appreciate it and appreciate everything that you do. You're a rock star too, Connie. Thank you, Rockstar Ryan, for all you do and for the conversation today. Thank you. And thank you to everybody who is watching. Join us again next week for what's happening. And um, in the meantime, I always tell folks, please register to vote. And if you are already registered to vote, please help somebody else to register to vote. It really matters in our democracy. And in the meantime, please do stay safe and take care and have a great week. Thank you.